Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So as you guys know, I recently did an update video on a research drug called HMI-115, which is a prolactin receptor monoclonal antibody drug which is being developed for the treatment of hair loss. As I said in that video, out of all the treatments that are currently in the pipeline today, HMI-115 has garnered more hype than any other treatment by far. Now, I, of course, have nothing against people finding new innovations and ways to treat hair loss, but I worry that the hype that is surrounding this HMI-115 compound and its mechanism of action has caused people to ignore the potential dangers as well as limitations that this drug may have. Just because a treatment may potentially treat hair loss without affecting DHT or the 5-AR enzyme does not mean it has a lower risk of side effects. In fact, the opposite may be true, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Usually when discussing the subject of hair loss, we have have to bring up the trash hormone DHT and the important role it plays in the progression of androgenic alopecia. However, ever since HMI-115 started getting hyped up on hair loss forums and subreddits, the discussion has gradually been shifting away from DHT and more towards the hormone prolactin. It has even gotten to the point where I've been hearing people speculating that prolactin plays an even bigger role than DHT when it comes to the progression of hair loss, and that hair loss researchers have gotten it all wrong over the years since it isn't DHT we should be focusing on. Rather, it is prolactin that is the true enemy of every hair loss sufferer across the globe. So, even though I've made a previous video on prolactin and hair loss that I'll link below, I thought that with all the recent hype surrounding HMI-115 and prolactin, it might be a good thing to take a balls deep dive into what exactly prolactin has to do with hair loss and how likely it is a prolactin receptor antibody like HMI-115 will help in our battle against the slaphead curse. So, Let's start with the hormone prolactin. Most of the prolactin in the blood is produced by the pituitary gland. What is interesting though, is that the hair follicles also produce prolactin, and there are prolactin receptors in the hair follicles. Furthermore, in the hair follicles, prolactin works like a paracrine hormone, meaning it is produced and acts locally. Interestingly enough, this is also how DHT acts in the hair follicles. DHT is created from circulating testosterone in the hair follicles by the 5-AR enzyme, and it's this DHT created from the 5-AR enzyme, which leads to the destructive effects on hair in people who have the androgenic alopecia gene. But getting back to prolactin in our hair follicles, it turns out that the levels of prolactin and the number of prolactin receptors in the hair follicles actually vary through the hair cycle. You can see in this figure from the first study that really examined the role of prolactin in hair growth, how the number of prolactin receptors varies throughout the hair cycle. There is a dip in prolactin receptors at the end of the telogen resting phase, followed by a rise during the antigen growth phase. This dip in the prolactin effect may be a trigger to restart the hair cycle and go from the telogen resting phase and transition into the antigen growth phase. So prolactin definitely seems to have something to do with the regulation of the hair cycle, and if you give large amounts of prolactin to mice, the amount of hair in the telogen resting phase increases and the amount of hair in the antigen growth phase decreases, which results in hair loss. Prolactin can also, at least in mice, trigger premature development of the catagen transition phase, which is the phase that ends the antigen growth phase. So because of this research that showed that too much prolactin causes hair loss, people then started to wonder if decreasing prolactin levels would be a good way to stimulate hair growth. It turns out that if you reduce the effects of prolactin by giving a prolactin receptor antibody to mice, it actually is a hair growth stimulant. This image here shows different female mice with normal or high prolactin levels, some of whom also got prolactin antibody. I won't go through the various combinations, but the the important thing to remember and notice here, Chooms, is that the mice in rows C and F are the ones that got the antibody, and they obviously had the best hair growth. Prolactin receptor antibodies even appear to improve hair growth in an animal model of androgenic alopecia. Macaca monkeys are one of the few animal species besides humans that develop androgenic alopecia, and in a small study of 11 macaca monkeys, 9 of them had hair regrowth after being treated with a prolactin receptor antibody. So... All this animal research is why there's a lot of hype on the internet about the HMI-115 prolactin receptor antibody, though it is still undergoing phase 1 studies for hair loss at the moment. This phase 1 study was almost derailed though, because one of the subjects decided to leak his results early on Reddit, which was insanely stupid because it almost got him kicked off the study. This could have easily caused some delays in finishing the study because it was a 24-week study, and I think he was at least halfway through the study period. If he had been kicked off the study, the 
investigators might have had to recruit another study candidate, which could have delayed the study by up to six more months to complete the data collection. Now, I know that this guy was snitched on, which was a dick move, of course, but it was still incredibly short-sighted of this guy to leak his results early, and he should be called out for being an attention whore who couldn't keep it in his pants. Anyways, I'm not going to revisit that, as it's what I covered in my last video on HMI-115, which is linked below, so let's get back to the data on prolactin and hair loss. So the animal research led to the development of HMI-115, even though it's not exactly clear that decreasing the effects of prolactin in the body would just be a general growth stimulant, or if high prolactin levels occur in the hair follicles in people with androgenic alopecia, and whether prolactin is related to DHT in some way. After all, if DHT is the master trash hormone that causes androgenic alopecia, then does DHT have any effect on prolactin levels, maybe? Since high prolactin is bad for hair growth, you might expect DHT to increase prolactin levels, but surprisingly, it actually does the opposite. However, this may just be an effect of prolactin from the pituitary gland, and we really don't know what effect DHT has on prolactin and prolactin receptors in the hair follicles. It's important to remember that even if prolactin is a hormone that contributes to the miniaturization of the hair follicles and androgenic alopecia, that would be just one of the many downstream effects of DHT. You see, DHT destroys your hair follicles in many, many different ways, such as having effects on the WNT wind pathway, the sonic hedgehog pathway, prostaglandins, TGF-beta, IGF-1, and a whole whole lot of other effects that all contribute to the destruction of our hair follicles. So, suppressing DHT benefits hair growth in many ways. Affecting prolactin may be just one of those downstream effects from suppressing DHT. Of course, individually targeting these downstream effects like prolactin may help improve hair growth, but it will never be as efficient as suppressing DHT since DHT is the hormone which is responsible for all of these downstream effects. So, even if HMI-115 is proven to have beneficial effects on hair growth, it is extremely unlikely that it will be as powerful as a 5-AR inhibitor since DHT triggers multiple different pathways besides any effect on prolactin, and all these pathways conspire to cause hair loss. However, people on Reddit and elsewhere have seized upon prolactin as the key to curing hair loss, and even though many of these people are scared to lower their DHT levels by taking finasteride, they all seem perfectly fine nuking their prolactin receptor levels by taking a monoclonal prolactin receptor antibody. Many of these same people criticize me when I say that DHT is a trash hormone. Their counter-argument will usually be an appeal to nature fallacy, such as saying that there's no such thing as a trash hormone, and that DHT must play some vital role for our health and virility, since there is no possible way our body would produce a hormone that only hurts us in adulthood, because nature never makes mistakes, right? Yet these very same people defending DHT are acting like you could suppress prolactin with no issues whatsoever, even though prolactin is also a hormone your body produces naturally. I bring this up only because because the communities that are hyping up HMI-115 the most are DHT simping communities who are too scared to use finasteride and have deluded themselves into thinking that they can keep their hair alive with just microneedling and minoxidil for the next several years until this HMI-115 treatment comes out and saves them all. So yes, the very same people who insist that DHT can't be a trash hormone since they say it makes no sense that our body would produce a hormone that does no good are also saying that prolactin is a trash hormone that could be suppressed without any problems in men. So of course you guys know that I have no problem calling DHT a trash hormone and I've created an entire video series explaining why and I'll link that below in case you haven't seen it yet but can the same thing be said about prolactin? Is prolactin really a trash hormone that could be suppressed without any ill effects? Well, the the short answer to that question is a resounding no. Prolactin is not a trash hormone. So I'm sure someone is watching this right about now and they're about to write in the comment section, but Kevin, everyone knows prolactin is just a hormone that is important for women. It's what makes milk, bro. It doesn't do anything important in men. Well, Fortunately, we have a recent article summarizing all the effects of prolactin in men. As the article points out, for a long time, prolactin was thought to be only a hormone important for females. However, that's no longer the case. First of all, like we've already covered, prolactin seems to be involved with the hair cycle, which obviously affects men and women. But if prolactin is important for hair growth in men, isn't it possible that it's important for other functions in men as well? Well, 
Prolactin receptors are found in the brain, and prolactin is involved with the regulation of dopamine and serotonin levels in the brain, which are important in mood disorders like depression. Prolactin receptors are also found in the testes. So what happens in men if prolactin levels are low? Well, it's kind of ironic here, Chooms, because for all the hype HMI 115 gets from the finasteride haters online, it turns out that low prolactin levels produce almost all the problems that people attribute to the fake condition called post-finasteride syndrome. For example, low prolactin is associated with decreased semen volume. Low prolactin is also associated with decreased penile blood flow. But it gets even worse than that, Chooms. Low prolactin levels are associated not only with erectile dysfunction, but also with premature ejaculation. In this study of nearly 3,000 men, the strongest correlation with low prolactin levels was decreased enjoyment of the orgasmic experience. So all this sounds pretty bad, and the people thinking that suppressing prolactin is a way to get around the sexual side effects that sometimes happen with finasteride are absolutely kidding themselves. But not only that, it turns out that low prolactin levels may also affect menusteroids, since it has been shown that low prolactin levels can cause both anxiety and depression. So maybe we need to change the definition of PFS from post-finasteride syndrome to prolactin failure syndrome. Now, it's still not clear if these problems from low prolactin are just a correlation or causation. All this research on prolactin in men is only about 10 or 12 years old at the moment, and clearly more research into the effects of prolactin in men needs to be done. As the study on the effects of prolactin in men concludes, quote, whether prolactin plays a direct role in these physiologic functions with low prolactin causing their impairment, or it is an epiphenomenon of different mechanisms, is still a matter of speculation and deserves further studies, unquote. What a lot of people who are hyping up HMI-115 are over looking, though, is that prolactin receptor antibodies are likely to have significant side effects because low prolactin is associated with sexual and neurological side effects. So at best, HMI-115 will be a marginally effective adjunct hair loss treatment on par with something like minoxidil, and at worst, it could be an outright dangerous treatment because unlike DHT, prolactin is not a trash hormone and it plays important physiological roles in the body. Even in the best case scenario, though, there is no way in hell HMI-115 115 is going to be better than finasteride because the prolactin issue is just one of the many ways in which DHT destroys your hair. Targeting just one of the downstream effects of DHT is never going to be as effective as removing all the downstream effects by getting rid of the DHT altogether. Now look, Chooms, I am not trying to be a stick in the mud or an attention-seeking contrarian here. Many of you guys have seen my videos on treatments like pyrolutamide, S3, and GT20029, so you know that normally I am excited about upcoming treatments. But what frustrates me about HMI-115 is that the people who seem to be hyping it up the most are people who hate finasteride. They're acting like HMI-115 will save them because they're too afraid to suppress their DHT because they've bought into the propaganda and lies from DHT simps that DHT is an important hormone, which of course it isn't past early adolescent development. They think suppressing prolactin is their way around this when the reality is that suppressing prolactin has far more potential for danger than suppressing DHT. The truth is, prolactin inhibition is not the future of hair loss, and HMI-115 will very likely turn out to be a disappointment, even if it somehow makes it onto the market, which won't be for a very, very long time, being that it hasn't even passed phase one clinical trials yet. By the time HMI-115 hits the market, if it ever happens at all, we'll already have access to things like GT20029 and pyrolutamide, which are far better and will likely make HMI-115 an obsolete treatment before it even comes out, and that's if it even comes out at all. So the bottom line based on all this data I've reviewed is that I don't think HMI-115 will be the panacea for hair loss that some people claim it will be. Of course, I'll continue to follow the science, and as more data is released, I'm prepared to change my opinion, of course, but I implore the hair loss community, please, for the love of God, let's get the study done without any more people leaking the results until Dr. Sinclair has the opportunity to present them formally at a scientific meeting. I waited eight years for Cyberpunk 2077 to come out after CD Projekt Red first announced it in 2012, so at the very least, you guys can wait until the end of the year when we get more data on HMI-115. Until then, let's please calm our tits and be patient, alright? Cool. God bless. Thank you for watching.